been talking about sin for a while now, and we're coming closer towards uh, what I consider to be a, a conclusion, or a, we've gotten a, enough of the discussion in that everyone who's been here for at least a few of the classes has a much clearer idea of, of what sin is and how it affects us and so on and so forth. Now, that said, I still think we need probably tonight and next week to, to finish things out. And then if things go slowly, then maybe even one more week. Like two weeks ago, we ended up discussing stuff that I hadn't oh, prepared yeah. to discuss. But it was really beneficial. It was really good that we went in that, that direction. So who knows? I'm totally willing for uh, the discussion to sprout off in any direction because it's, it's fun that way. Um, and I, I think it's beneficial, especially when people have questions that need answered. So we were talking about sin. And we were talking about the big question of why everybody has done it. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you say, all? I mean, that's all of us, right? When you're talking about sin, you say every single, when you tell me if you agree with this statement, every single human being that has ever existed with the sake of the one that was in Jesus Christ has sinned at least once. Would you agree with that statement? Yes. Theologically speaking? Yes. Yeah, okay, so that's... That's the view of sin. We've all sinned. All human beings have sinned, at least at one point or another. So the question is, why? Why have we all sinned? And we looked at you know, what sin is and what goes into it and so on and so forth. And one of the things that we were very clear on is that sin is not natural for us. God did not create us to sin. Sin is counter our nature. And not only that, it's destructive. It's destructive for him. It's destructive for us. It hurts the people around us. It's, it's all around a pretty negative decision. You, know, you, you don't want to sin. It never really goes well for you in the short run or in the long run when you choose to sin stuff. So the question is, if sin is a straight bad for you, and we've all done it, why? Why have we all done it? Why has every single human being chosen stupidity? over what is clearly right? And that's a big question. That is one of the core questions that makes up, uh, that makes up your theological camp, as it were. You know, we, we talked about in the nature of God, the different uh, main views of God's nature. And this is right up there with things like predestination and so on and so forth. It's right up there. Why have all people sinned? And there's, uh, you know, there's a multiplicity of views. But... Basically, and we, I'm doing recap to some degree or another here, but basically you can boil it down to two main views. And we looked at them very briefly a couple weeks ago. But really, you can boil it down to two main views as far as why everybody has sinned. So view number one. View number one is that we are all born sinners. And we have inherited a sinful nature from Adam. So in other words, yeah, maybe you've heard this, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. In other words, this is what we are. We are this. I was, I was uh, on a forum, and this guy was talking about how, you know, well, no, they were debating religion back and forth, and he was just talking about Christianity and what Christianity really means, and... He was saying, no, Christianity means that God has all power and human beings are crap. We're nothing. We're worthless piles of garbage. We're sinners. We're, just, we're, we're lower than low. We're terrible, depraved creatures that can do nothing but wickedness. This is what this means. We are born sinners. We inherited a sinful nature like Adam's choice twisted the human situation, twisted the human condition, and that choice passed down to us. Now, whether that is genetically, some people believe it's in the blood. Some views say sin is in the blood. And Jesus didn't sin because he was born without, it was immaculate conception. There was no sexual interaction or intercourse there. It was immaculate conception. Jesus was by the Holy Spirit into Mary, and that's, he didn't get the special sin blood. 
Uh, these days, it's more of viewed as some kind of spiritual twisting of the nature that we inherited. But either way, it's something we inherit. It's something we're born into. And what it means is, and once again, this is, this is the orthodox or classical way of thinking about sin. Uh, what it means is we, that sin is what we do. There's not choice involved. Sin is what we do at our natural state. We just sin. And maybe God chooses some people to come in and he fixes them. And then we have the choice to sin or not sin. But at the very least, we're all born sinners. You look at that little baby over there. And that baby is a depraved, rotten sinner that does nothing but sin. You look at that 6-year-old or that 15-year-old or that 20-year-old. They're all depraved sinners. This is what this means. It's the orthodox classical way of thinking. And there, uh, I mentioned this, but there's an obvious strength to this view, and there's an obvious weakness. So the strength is that it's a really good explanation of why we've all done it, isn't it? You say, why have we all sinned? Why in the world have all the billions upon billions of human beings all gone against what God designed them to do and what should be natural for them? And it's because, okay, well, what was natural for us was twisted. And now it is natural for us. It's a really good explanation of why we've all done it. Now, the weakness is that it's a really bad explanation of why we are guilty for anything. Here's the thing. When you're talking about morality, when you're talking about moral guilt, freedom of choice is crucial to that whole thing. If you look in a court of law, it's very important whether you freely did something or whether you didn't. If somebody slept, walked, and murdered someone, and that, that's what actually happened, it's a whole different story from if you have a predetermined murder. Now, it doesn't mean you're, just, you know, you're free or whatever else, but it's a, it's a different thing. It's recognized as a different thing because people know the freedom of choice is core to having guilt. Mm -hmm. If you didn't freely choose something, you're not freely guilty of that thing. And so this is a problem for this view. It's the obvious weakness. It's a very good explanation of why we've all done it. It's a very bad explanation as to why we're guilty. Because if we're all sinners by birth, and if we cannot help but sin, why, why would we be, in any real sense of the word, guilty? It's just what we do. How can we be guilty for what we cannot help but do? A rock is not guilty for falling. It just does it. It had no choice involved. It just falls. So this is a problem for this view. It's a problem. It's a problem when you start thinking about how God seems to be very frustrated with humanity and constantly calling humanity to a higher standard. But any kind of frustration or him holding us to a standard, is, it's crazy if you think about this. So anyway, that's a, that's a problem. There's the obvious strength and the obvious weakness. Now, the second view boils down to this. And once again, you'll find shades of both of these, but these are, at bottom line, these are the two big ones that I, I think are worth considering at least. Number two, all of us have individually chosen to be our own Adam or our own Eve. All of us have gone freely into sin. All of us have freely chosen it. God created us as creatures that are moral. He created us with the ability to freely choose our actions, and all of us have freely chosen to sin. And go against what he created us to do, to do something that is stupid, the inferior choice that is destructive, but we chose to do it anyway. And each of us, just like Adam and Eve, chose to do that what they did so stupidly so long ago, we have done the same thing. That's the second main view. We are born this way, or we've all chosen it. Again, you'll find shades of either view, but these are the two big ones. Now, just as with this first one, there's an obvious strength and there's an obvious weakness. What would you think would be a strength of that second view? A strength of the second view? Mm -hmm. um, it's a better reason as to why we're guilty. Well, yeah. In opposite mm -hmm. of the first one. It puts a huge emphasis on personal responsibility, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. If it's your choice, 
well then you, you and nothing else whatsoever are responsible for what you've done, right? Yes. Every action you have done is up to you. There's no blaming anything else. There's no giving an excuse. It is your choice in the end. Now, the Bible appears to place a great emphasis upon personal responsibility and accountability. So in that sense, that's a very good strength for that view. It seems to line up with what the Bible appears to support in terms of personal responsibility and personal accountability. So, on the flip side, what do you think would be a major weakness here? That we have a choice that God has nothing to do with it. That we are making the choice and he reacts to our choice. Hmm. That's actually on a whole other level. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, if you look at this view as saying, God gave us the freedom to choose. Mm -hmm. He created us with wanting us to be able to have that choice. Mm -hmm then uh, I don't think that's necessarily a weakness. No. Because if God said, I want you to be able to have the freedom to choose, I want to be able to interact with you, yes. then that could even be considered a strength, mm. depending on what you value. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. So I'm looking for something a little bit different. And it, it's reflected in, one of the, uh, in, in what is the strength of the first one. Mm. Um, if I word it, it's, uh, it's a good explanation. It's a bad explanation of why we sin, rather. Yeah. So up here, if we're born sinners, that's a darn good explanation of why we all sin. Because mm -hmm. none of us have a choice. Mm -hmm. It is written in the stars, if you will. Mm -hmm. But if we all have a choice, mm -hmm. if every single one of us was born with the ability to choose this or this, why in the world have every single one of us chosen this way, at least at one point? Mm -hmm. If it's the inferior choice, why have every one of us chosen it at least once? Mm -hmm. That's a really bad explanation mm -hmm. of why we've all sinned. Mm -hmm. Once again, when you look at the, the, the scope of theology, these are what it can be boiled down to. Now, you could also have fatalism, in which God has predetermined every single one of your actions. Um, and then there might be another shade down here somewhere where there's freedom of will, but it's on a modal level where God has different ways he interacts with, with humanity and with reality. And on the first level, he interacts fully. and the second level, he only has knowledge of it. On the third level, he predetermines it and somehow it works together. And it, it's called Molinism, and it's really nuts. But anyway, there's shades of all this stuff. Okay. What I've done is boil it down to the two main ones. This is what you're going to see reflected in pretty much every major theologian you've ever heard of. One of these two. But once again, you have, you have a very serious strength for both of them that make both of them worth considering. And you have a very serious weakness in both of them that make both of them uh, necessary to look at very closely and examine biblically and examine not just biblically but philosophically as well. There's a reason God gave us the ability to reason and not just the Bible. Give us both. There are things that we can know about God and about reality that are clear about nature and are clear about the way things work in general. This is what you call general revelation versus special revelation is the Bible. But yeah, these are the two main ones here. If I could, just a question. Sure. About, um, sometimes it seems broad when we're saying sinners when we talk about sin nature, okay? My, this is only sometimes my understanding, and it's not, I'm not claiming to be clear on that. My thought of sin nature, when it's, we have to look at then what we were, had to determine what sin was, right? And sin, at, if you take it as sin being a, a falling short of God's standard, all right? If that's what we're gonna say, born sinners or having that sin nature, or it could be that serving yourself, self-serving, is also sin, right? Mm -hmm. So, if when we're talking about that sin nature that we derive from Adam, being that they serve themselves by taking that fruit, right, making that choice, I would say so. Yeah. Okay. So that's our nature that we all have of serving ourselves, and that may be show up in many, many, many different ways. But 
I always thought that we were like, I mean, we're responsible for them because of free will. But inevitably, we, when you're doing the flesh, you're serving, you're picking yourself when, and you start serving the flesh. And somehow there's a, a breakup here between flesh and spirit. Yeah, I mean, I'm not clear. I can't give you this. No, I know exactly what you're saying. Because there's a difference between, over here, you have causality. Mm. In other words, what you're describing is something that is a leaning, like a tendency. Mm. That makes sense. But the question would be for me, if, we, if we're, we're taking this point from Adam and Eve onward, but for Adam and Eve to have sinned, all right, then they had to have that ability within them. Yeah. So we're talking about created with that nature. I don't even know how can, you, how can we say it came from Adam and Eve if, if they had it in them to sin. Well, the view up here, and I'll just tell you what, this is what's commonly expressed. Adam and Eve were created neutral with the abilities down here, with the abilities of individual choice. They, for whatever reason, individually chose sin and that corrupted the human nature. And that was passed down to every single human beyond that. And again, once again, according to this view, that corrupted human nature made it so that is what we naturally do. That's just what we do. We just sin. So there's no like struggle or resisting it. We just sin. Unless God comes in and fixes us. So this is this so they're saying that Adam's choice created our Yes, that's exactly right. Mm. And they get that from things like Romans 5, where it says, through one man, death came to all men. Oh, yeah. That's the big, uh, well, that, that really is probably the biggest single verse in support of uh, total depravity. Um, now, what, what you're describing here is a, what you mentioned, we have a sin nature that leans us in a direction, but there's also a struggle and there's also a choice we make in the end in which we're individually responsible for its actions. That's a, kind of a, something in between here in which being born with a sin nature isn't a causative thing, but is a highly influential thing. Make sense? So a cause would be, there's no saying no to a cause. Bam. It's a tilt that you cannot stop. An influence would be a tilt that leans on you, pushes you in direction, but in the end you could say no. You could resist the tilt. You could resist the push. It's just a lot harder than if it was neutral. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yes. So, in order to be able to have responsibility, it would have to be either here or something in the middle, where what you call a sin nature wouldn't be a causative thing, but would be an influential thing. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Now, I, there there are views in which you you could say there are views in which people say something along those lines. Um, However, generally it ends up in one of these two camps. Strictly because of the way the scriptures word it, and I meant to mention here, both of these have evidence from scripture you could use in support of them. Both of them do. Uh, people don't just pull these out of their hats. Um, but because of the way the language in the scripture is worded, it either seems that it's Definitely way over here, or definitely way over here. Simply because of the language. And hopefully I'll be able to get to some of the verses and show you what I'm talking about here. But, once again, and just summarizing what we just said, these are the two main camps here. In the end, it's either we have no choice, or we do have a choice. Now, once again, you know, the, weak, the strengths and weaknesses. If it is this one, to me there's got to be an answer. If it is the fact that we're born sinners, there's got to be an answer to why God can hold us accountable. And if it's number two, that it's all our individual choice, there's got to be an answer as to why we've all done it. It's not as simple as, I guess everyone's done it. That doesn't work. It's not that easy. Okay, so boiled down, both of these two beliefs are our very core beliefs of Armenianism and Calvinism, like separately? <sighs> sort of. Up here would be very clearly the Reformed view. Definitely. Now what's interesting is, so Reformed as in, I'm sure you could call it Calvinism. Mm. Um, or Orthodox or Classical thinking or whatever you want to call it. Decidedly in this direction. 
And then even some Calvinists would be even further up here with fatalism. God has predestined the reaction. But most of them fall over here. We're born sinners, and we can only do these things. We can only sin. What's interesting is Arminianism would actually fall... I mean, if it ends up falling into here logically, but it holds this belief. The thing about Calvinism, or Reformed theology, is we're all born sinners, and then God handpicks some of us based upon nothing we've ever done, and regenerates us. He fixes that thing that Adam's choice broke, and then that gives us the freedom to choose again. Okay? That is the, that's the reform view. But it's only some people. It's the elect, the chosen. Okay? Everyone else, out of luck. They're going to continue sinning forever, and they will burn in hell forever, because they were born sinners and God did not choose to, to re re uh, regenerate them. Our meaning is one actually say that everybody was born sinners. However, God chose to regenerate Everyone. Now, to me, it says, why even bother saying we're all born sinners? Because you don't need that. Because in the end, it's all about individual choice with Arminianism. Uh, the answer to that is because James Arminius was adapting Calvin's views into something that was very similar but wasn't a huge break from Calvinism. Taking the, the, the core tenets of Reformed theology, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints, mm -hmm. and adapting to something very closely, mm -hmm. as opposed to being this huge new thing. Um, but once again, they either fall into here or here. Whether you're talking about hyper-Calvinism, Calvinism, Armenianism, open theism, or anything else. It's either going to be here or here in the end. Even if over here, if you have a sin nature that influences us very strongly, in the end, no influence is a cause. Make sense? Even if the influence is a very strong one, you can still say no to any influence whatsoever. Yes. As long as there's the fact that, or as long as there's the ability to choose, it's still your choice in the end. Even if it was a hard choice. Yeah. Once again, either here or here. Uh, and there's a lot of history that goes into these views with Augustine and Pelagius and a guy named John Cassian with uh, you know, the Augustinian view is up here and then the Pelagian view would be over here or you could also, it might be down here a little bit or maybe John Cassian's view would be around here somewhere. I know this is confusing but I'm hoping to go into the history at some point because it's, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Seeing, uh, going over briefly the life of Augustine and why he came to the views that he had. Um, he was a man who lived lasciviously. In other words, enjoying every physical pleasure. He, he, he had a serious problem with indulging himself. Uh, when he became a very devoted Christian, Bishop of Hippo, uh, he was very conflicted. Like, why do I still struggle with all these things? And he came to the conclusion that well, that is just what he does, naturally. Um, anyway, there's a lot more to the story, but this is a bit of the picture. So, in, in your, your opinion, because whether you're here, again, very easy answer, whether you're here, you don't have to say which one you're in, but in, in your opinion, if I were to say, why do you think everybody has sinned? Or what are some reasons why you think everyone has sinned? What would you throw out? Culture. <clears throat> Culture, okay, what do you mean? Well, everyone's doing it this way, so that's the way I can learn how I talk to do it, and that's what I do. Okay, yeah. Well, I think scripturally, right in the very first, the, with the fall of man, it, it lists the first three things, the lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, and I think that's unique to us as human beings, right? Yeah, right. Actually, I'm actually going to go there. With the flesh. Actually, you know, that's in James. Yes. So, I mean, you know, I don't know why. I mean, even sin, when you, when you think, it, when you say sin, uh, that's like such a multitude of, of actions, right? I mean, you could say it's a falling short of standard, but then you can name a million different ones that are falling short of standard. So, um, ah, gosh, I don't know. But it seems to me that God made us, if, if we're assuming that all-powerful, all-knowing God 
created this, right? In his image. The way he said, laid it out in Genesis. I still can't, I have yet to be comfortable with um, saying how that uh, sin nature came about if it wasn't in his creation. You know, he created that. That that went, and I don't mean as a sin, but as that free will, because really a sin nature is almost a free will nature, isn't it? I mean, well, I mean, you here can't sin, like you said, you can't sin without free will. Mm -hmm. You have to have free will to be able to sin. Well, uh, once again, some people would not agree with that at all. But if, it, but if it's not free will, then like you said, how can you be held responsible? Well, I mean, once again, that's the problem. Right. right. Yeah. That's exactly the problem we face. Um, that's the problem that I personally have. Because having studied guys like John Locke and William Blackstone, I understand the heart of law. Once again, free will is, in my opinion, it seems clear clearly that free will is core to morality. Free will is core to guilt. So how can God help us guilty if we don't have the ability to freely choose yay or nay? That's a big problem. Yeah. I mean, how can you fellowship with somebody if the, if the fellowship is forced? How can you love if the love is dictated? How can, if there's no value in any of it? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. So once again, it's a problem and when we have to think about it. Um, one, thing, one thing to consider. We know that God despises sin. Mm. I mean, that, that's very clear. Mm. He hates it. When he created Adam and Eve, he looked upon exactly what he created and he said, you know what? All of this is very good. Mm. All of it. Yes, he did say that. He did say that. Now, take what you will from that. But for me, it says that everything that he created was perfect. Mm. That there were no flaws in his creation. Mm. That's at least how I read it. Does, it. does it indicate that he meant it was complete? I don't think there's a, I don't think we can say from what he said whether he thinks it was complete or not. We just know that he thinks it was good. I think it was certainly wasn't complete. But it had, it had, he, he was satisfied that the basis for completion was there. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I keep toying with my head with the learning process. <laughs> it's, it's not you an know, easy question. Learning, yeah. You know, I mean, how do you do with a, a Adam and Eve, they were certainly, how would they know evil if they didn't, I mean, if everything was good? I mean, it, there's all kinds of questions that I can't. Uh, well, here's a question. I'm, I'm going on the tangent here. <laughs> if, if Adam and Eve were created, they were just created, do you think they were created inherently good or inherently evil or just blank slate? Blank slate would be my initial thought. It seems to me that it could not be just inherently good. Let's say we're up here. Good. Neutral. Evil. If God created them inherently good, you already have a fully fleshed out creature. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, these guys are basically newborns. They could have been created in the form of children, for all we know. When you, when you look at what we know of kids, have you ever met a kid that was just born completely patient, and completely kind, completely long-suffering, <laughs> merciful? <laughs> I, I haven't. Definitely have. Look, I mean, look even more recently, I mean, like a 10 year old. Or once they hit that age, which the Bible calls the age of accountability, they start becoming accountable for their actions because they know what they're doing. And it seems to me, at least in my experience, they hover a lot more around here than anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. They're not just naturally really good, but they're not just naturally really wicked either. No. Some people will say, look at a baby, look at that baby crying and screaming for what it wants. It's evil. To me, that says all babies know is that they have a need yes. and they need it. Yes. They don't have a consciousness of how their actions affect other people. Right. They're primal by the definition of the word. Yes. They have a need, they have a want, they need it. Yes. Now, once they hit this point, maybe around age six or seven, 
they suddenly start becoming aware of how their actions affect other people. The Bible calls it the age of accountability. That's a thing. I'd like to talk about this sometime. Yeah. But the Bible implies that there is an age at which human beings become accountable for their actions, yes. and before that, they're not. Yes. You're right. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So to me, that implies neutrality. Mm -hmm. Now, if this was the case, and let's just imagine here for a minute, if God created Adam and Eve as a blank slate, which to me seems that it would, it would have had to have been the clear... To me, that it seems like that he would have created them as a blank slate, wanting to grow them up and walking alongside them into creatures that were good. But he looked at them and he said, this is very good. I think he looked at the base, and once again, you're looking at my opinion here. I think he looked at what he cre had created. The creatures he had created made in his image with the ability to choose, the ability to develop, and he said, that's a good thing. Yes. The work that I've done is good. Yes. I don't think he would have done this because it seems like all of reality is set up to grow us up into creatures yes. he wants to be able to walk alongside. Yes. I also don't think he would have done this. The reason being, he wouldn't have called this a good thing. No. Just once again. And this is very, very free thinking stuff. Not like free thinkers, but what I mean is this discussion we had just now, you will find very little basis from which to found any of this. Mm -hmm. This is just taking what we do know and saying, making some hypothetical conclusions. Mm -hmm. okay. I like doing that stuff. Yes. I think it can be valuable. Yes. We have to be careful in saying, this is what is true. Yeah. Because I thought about it and this seems like it might work. Yeah. To me, this seems like the best conclusion based on yeah. what I know of God and based on what I know of human beings. Yes. I don't think he would have said that it was good for really anything else. I don't think he would have created us good at our core. Yeah. I don't think he would have created us neutral without, well, I don't think he would have created us evil and said that it was good. I think he created us just flat. Yes. Ready to be built upon. Yes, I do too. Anyway, got off on a tangent there. It was fun though. Yeah. Um, so culture is one possible solution here because everyone around us does it. And you might even have been taught that from your parents. Yeah. Like You're taught more things from your parents than they explicitly tell you. Mm -hmm. You're taught by watching, by, by observing. <clears throat> you notice how sins tend to run in the family? Yeah. When I say sins run in the family, I mean particular ways of acting and living tend to run in the family. You grow up watching a father who is insecure and has anger issues, nine times out of 10, you're going to struggle with that. I'm not saying you, I, mean, I don't believe you have to be that way, but I watched my dad have anger issues when he was younger. I have to fight every day against the exact same anger issues. Because that's what I watched growing up when I was really young. He was in a when you watch this, Dad, you were an amazing father. <laughs> but his father had the same thing. Whose father had the same thing. You, you learn more from your parents than you know. You learn more from those around you. Yes. So yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a good answer. I don't think it can be the whole answer, because even that is not a really great explanation as to why, if we all have the individual choice, the, the culture, is that the whole picture? No. Uh, I think... I think the progression, and this, this might be worded kind of weird, but like, whenever you look at uh, like starting out, like beginning, you're neutral in the beginning, you know, um, I think the progression of your life is kind of like, you can't really, I, I can't really express what that is exactly, but I think that some people progress in a good way and some people progress in a bad way. And, um, some people ultimately choose evil, and some people ultimately choose good. But I think, I don't know. I know what you're saying. It's very difficult to express that in words, if that makes sense. No, I, I totally get it. Let's pretend this is the same scale, but over here at a line. Neutral, evil, good, okay? Let's say we're all over here. Life does not work in such a way 
Okay, you make a choice, that's good, and then just swing back to the neutral. Mm. It doesn't go choice by choice. It doesn't go in such a way where you make a bad decision and then swing back to neutral the moment, the moment that decision's over. Life does not develop on a decision by decision basis. Rather, and it's a lot more complicated than this little diagram is going to make it out to be because I think oftentimes it works in areas. Sexual temptation, lying, stealing, regard for other human beings, pride, whatever else. I think that very often we inch ourselves in a direction. And suddenly, this is where we are at resting point, as opposed to over here. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. You guys know, anyone know anything about physics? A little bit? Well, here's some basic physics for you. Okay, anyone know what momentum is? It's that kind of rolling along that comes next and comes next and what comes next. Is this like things in motion tend to stay in motion? Well, that's the next thing. Momentum means a physical item in motion tends to pick up velocity, especially when gravity is on its side. Now, the other thing is this is important. This is what you said, Richard. Inertia. What does inertia mean? Mm. What you just said. Sort of, but... Mm. Say, an item that is in motion... Sorry, no. Items tend to resist being moved from their current state. Whether it's sitting, whether it's moving, whether it's falling, it resists change. Mm. Okay? So... Let's say you have a big, a 600 pound boulder, and it's just sitting there. It's gonna be pretty hard to get it moving. You have to put some force into it. It resists change. However, if you have a boulder that is already rolling a little bit, and you come behind it and start pushing it, it's gonna go a lot easier. It has momentum on the side. This is basic physics. I actually really believe that you can apply both momentum and especially inertia to human beings. Yes. Specifically to human beings and the development of habit. Yes. I'll show you what I mean. And I, I've mentioned this before, but I really do believe in the momentum and the inertia of the will and the habit. When you're over here, and one day you start making decisions that are rooted in the pride of life, mm. being a proudful person, puffed up in your existence, making yourself the prime end of your life. I think as you make those decisions over and over and over again, I think not only do you pick up momentum, but I think by the time you find yourself over here, you're gonna find it a whole lot harder to do something over here. Because not only do you have momentum on your side, you have inertia. Yeah. You guys know how hard it is to stop something that is rolling down a hill and push it in the opposite direction? As opposed to running up behind something that's running down a hill and push it in the same direction? Yeah. You get the picture I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Well, again, this is basic physics. I really do believe it works for the will. And I think we get really frustrated when we when people become Christians for the first time yeah. and they look at all their, their sin habits and they go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to never sin again. People have a sexual addiction for 20 years making the same decisions with no resistance and then suddenly one day they say, you know what? No more. And they find that they fall right back into it. Why? Why is this so hard? Why, God? Why? Why can't I just... And they say, okay, wait a minute. You know what? It's impossible. I can't choose anything but this. I give up. You know how many people I've seen throw their hands up and give up in different areas of sin in their lives? Obviously, I've tried over and over and over again and I can't do it. It's 
there is nothing I can do. I believe you're pushing against something that you've built. You're pushing against a structure that you have built up in your own heart. Yes. It's not that easy. It's not a one. I, I don't believe that it's a single choice kind of thing. I'm going to tear down this castle. And then you get tired after swinging the pickaxe one time. Oh, this is never going to come down. Heard the expression, Rome wasn't built in a day. I don't think the pride of life is built up in your heart over 20 years and then torn down in an afternoon after you have a convicting experience at church. Now, I also don't think it takes 20 years to undo 20 years of your own bad work because we're not the only ones working inside of us. Especially when you say, God, I need your help. I'm going to give everything I can. Please come and give everything you can to helping me. I really believe that within weeks and months, you can see years of damage undone. Yes. I really do. I do too. But I think breaking habit takes serious effort. We don't consider that enough. We don't talk about that enough. No. When I was a kid, and I've used, used this example a few times, but I, that was the first thing I think of. When I was a kid, I had really gnarly teeth, really messed up teeth. Just pointing in all kinds of directions. So I had to have braces. But before that, I had a lisp that I wasn't even aware of. You know, a lisp, lisp. Making my S's with my tongue between my teeth instead of S behind your teeth. I know, like, you're like, wow, how could that even happen? Because when everyone makes their S's, they put their, their tongue behind their teeth, their teeth together, S. But I heard S, S, S for my whole life. I never even knew it. My dad one day said, son, you have a lisp. Now you have two choices. My choices were, I could get a, um, a tongue inhibitor installed in the roof of my mouth that would make it so every time I tried to move my tongue between my teeth, it would, it would block it. So I'd have to learn to keep my tongue behind my teeth when I make the S shape. Um, the other choice was spend, he, he said, son, it takes one month to build a habit. He said, spend one month of your life very carefully forming every single word you're going to say all day. And do not let yourself just jump into your habit of saying, Pfft. make the S's correctly. Force yourself to do it for one month. If that doesn't work, then we do the, you know, the tongue inhibitor thing. I know you don't want to do it, but we'll just have to if it doesn't work after a month. Um, I said, it takes a month to form a habit. So I did. I was homeschooled uh, during that time. So it's not like I was, you know, suffering, you know, all my friends, you know. Um, but I, I spoke extremely slowly for an entire month because I would have to think of every word. And there's no S's in those words. I'd have to very carefully think out every single word. I was, I was going to say, and say, okay, is there, is there an S in here? Yes? Okay, how do I form this? S not th and I did it for an entire month. It was really miserable. It was a miserable month. But after a month, I had broken the habit of going th and I formed an entirely new habit. S and it stuck with me my entire life. I don't even have to think about it anymore. I don't have to think about it anymore. It's great. <laughs> no more lists. I don't have to try not to be a, a, a verbally impaired person. <laughs> <clears throat> Yet we treat overcoming years of sin habits like it should be a week-long effort or something. And I, I think if a verbal impairment takes a month of hard work, then we should expect at least, at least that much effort with sin habits in our lives. At least. I think that's a big reason of why it feels like we can't. Because yes. we give up really easily. Yes. That said, I don't think it's as hard as years and years and years of habit. I think we take things really, really, uh, we go about it very relaxedly, relaxedly. So if you were to say, okay, I want you to get really good at basketball. Well, you know, you get really good at basketball and I'll give you anything you want. Any wish you want if you get really good at basketball in like the next year. Well, what would you do? You would... 
go out and start playing basketball every single day. You'd find a coach to come and train you and you'd read books about it. I'd watch YouTube videos. I was trying to get a tennis and my life got busy, so I stopped. But I was watching YouTube videos on form. I was reading forums. I was trying to study and get my form exactly right. And I was going out there and practicing for hours every day. And that's how you get good at tennis. That's how you get good at basketball. That's how you get good at painting or an instrument or anything. You work your tail off. I really think if we put that much effort and energy into being Christ-like, we'd have a whole lot more Christ-like Christians. Like legitimately Christ-like Christians if we went about it in the same way a professional athlete goes about his training. Absolutely. I think that um, whenever you want to do something, we do put effort into it. It's the, the times where we don't really put our effort in, where we fall short all the time. Yeah. And sometimes we get a little flippant about it all. We do. Oh, you know, we absolutely get. Next we get week very I'll start flippant. In, I'll, you know, whatever it is. And it, it's it's um, it's Paul who describes it as a race. Mm. Yeah. He says this is. You know, and Paul was around the times when he could have actually gone and watched the Olympics happening. Yeah, it's incredible. Which is pretty cool to think about. Yeah. Um, but he says, look, this is not a. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. Run the race. Running is not a passive thing. You're running. You guys ever been in a foot race? I, uh, I ran track. Oh, wow. Stupidly. My senior year of high school. I didn't even like running. I liked playing sports, but I hated running. But all my friends were running track that year. Come run track. Let's do the running without the fun. You know, the, the sport, the ball, you're trying to get into a hoop or a net. Uh, so I said, yeah, sure, I'll go do that. Um, and I, I was pretty fast, but they had me running the 400, which is, to me, the worst race in the world because it's a quarter mile and there's no pacing. You just yeah, sprint mm. for a quarter mile, which is a lot longer than it sounds. Mm. You can sprint for like an eighth of a mile or a sixteenth of a mile, and then it's okay. But a quarter mile is a long time. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I ran the 400. I hated it. It was miserable. And every race, you would just be pushing every ounce of your body and sprinting as long as you can. And you sprint about 300 meters. You get to 100 meters left, and you have no energy left. That's it. You're out of energy. You're like, I'm ready to be done. But at least I spent all my energy, and I'm way ahead of everybody. <laughs> Except that everyone else is right there. <laughs> You're out of energy, and so are they. And they're all right there, breathing down your neck, and you're just running with everything. I have no energy left, and you're just... <laughs> it's miserable. It's terrible. But it, uh, every single race, I put everything within me, every last ounce of energy I had into finishing the darn race. And then I'd finish it, and a few times I would win, and I'd be like, yay, 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 and I'd stumble into the center field and vomit everywhere. And it kind of took the, the, the thrill of victory away. Um, bottom line is, running a race is... Intense. It is everything within you. You're kicking your own butt to get across the darn finish line. Yeah. I think if we approach Christianity anything like that, we would really have a lot of Christ-like Christians. That's the biggest, the biggest complaint the whole world has about Christianity. Yeah. Is why aren't your Christians anything like the, the things that your Christ taught? Yeah. Was Gandhi's big problem. I love your Christ. I do not like your yeah. Christians. You know, I think that we don't give... Um... You know, we always say, oh, yes, we see what it says, and I'm going to do what it says, but we don't actually do what it says, like Jesus tells us to do. But when we do, when you have that one chance where you do it, and it works, I mean, it's just like it works out, it's incredible. It is. And it starts the momentum in the other way. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we never get to that point. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I think it's laziness for me. You know, when you think of sin, not big sin, little sin, like trying to measure that, but obvious sin. I mean, most of us are not bank robbers or, you know, murderers or things like that. And right. you forget that the, um, or it's easy to excuse yourself and go, ah, it's not a big deal. So I got to pull my hand down, you know. Mm -hmm. so, That's right, you're saying. So I don't not, I wasn't nice to them today. You know, like it's no big deal, but that's really, that's a lot of the discipline of being Christ-like. Getting past those little foxes, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's true. You look at people who have just, they've done nothing but develop in the wrong way their entire lives. Yes. 
and they are just so thoroughly rooted in bitterness and anger and pride and unforgiveness that to them it's just like, well, that is obviously naturally just what they do. It's because their resting point is way over here. They don't have to try to be a jerk. They have to try really hard to not be a jerk. Yes. We can develop that way. Yes. For better or worse, for better or for worse, we have the ability of habit and development as moral creatures. I think it's an incredible, incredible ability we have. Because I think that it enables us to be Christ-like. Mm -hmm. To be holy as God is holy. As crazy as that is to think about. Yes. Here's a bit of thought. I honestly believe, and this is not canon, um, and I can be proven wrong someday, and be totally fine with it, but I honestly believe at this point that it's God's desire that after death, he wants to continue developing us into pe creatures that are just like him as far as his character goes. Mm -hmm. And then when we're so rooted in love in the same way that he is, eons and eons and eons away, then he wants to give us so much power that we can do whatever we want with it. Wow. Wow. And that wasn't, I wish I was smart enough to have come up with that, but I got that directly from C.S. Lewis and Dallas Willard. Really? They genuinely believe that God wants to set us loose. When he can trust us to do anything we want to do, he wants to trust us to do anything we want to do. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. Wow, that is really incredible. Creating our own universes. Wow. Creating our own anything. But none of us, I don't, think any, I don't think anyone you've ever met has come close to the level that God wants to trust them to do anything like that. No. But he wants to get us there. Mm. He wants to get us to the point that he doesn't have to... Right now, we imagine like, well, you know, I'm sort of walking alongside God, and we're not. We're like beaten up, almost corpse-like bodies as he's dragging along in a wagon behind us. <laughs> like, Come on, mate. <laughs> he wants to get us to the point that we are walking in strength alongside yes. him. And I really want to get to that point. Yeah. So here's what I've done. This has kind of got a little bit crazy because it went completely out of order from what I had planned. <laughs> but what I wanted to do is give you two reasons why I believe all, sorry, three reasons why I believe that all people have sinned. Oh, okay. And you guys gave me two of them. But number one, let's say... Everybody's doing it. I'm going to say this. You said culture. Yes. Barb. Yes. Um, I really do believe that we live in a world that is so dominated by that way of life mm -hmm. that from the, the moment we're able to make a free moral choice, we are pushed extremely strongly towards that yes, direction. absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when we were teenagers, it was still wrong to live together. But as we have grown up, and now it's like everywhere, it's not even looked at as anything that's wrong. Yeah. But when we were little kids, it was still wrong. It's just one little spot. But it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Everybody's doing it. When you're surrounded by family and friends mm -hmm. and peers and coworkers that are all doing one thing, mm -hmm. it's extremely, extremely difficult to say no. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Number two, and once again, the reason why I'm just listing these off is because this is exactly what we just talked about. You said culture, talk about that. And then number two, I believe that we build ourselves yes. into the habit of doing it. Yes. We start making little decisions and they build against us. Yes. And suddenly it's very, very easy to just keep on sinning, yes. keep on trucking. Number three is actually the first one I was going to look at tonight that we didn't get to look at. It's also the biggest one. Oh, wow. And it's three after seven. Oh, wow. Um, but it, it's funny. I, once again, I was going to talk about that one first and then this one and then this one. Well, because we had, we had questions and observations, we went in this direction. That's, that's totally fine. Uh, number three has to do with temptation and with desire.
And that's all I'm going to give you for now. Wow. Is that where carnal? Say again? <laughs> Is that where carnal comes in? <laughs> yeah, when you're talking about desire, it's a big deal. When you're talking about what James said about the lust of the eyes, mm -hmm. the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Specifically those first two. The lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. What that means exactly. How that relates to desire, how that relates to temptation, how it relates to what it means to be tempted and how we're tempted. All of the above. There's a lot of really interesting stuff to go into. But we are going to call it a night for now.